All right, thank you, Pastor Nathaniel, again. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, if you have a Bible, turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. We're going to look at a text that became pivotal for Martin Luther and the other Reformers in guiding and directing their understanding of the idea of priesthood, reshaping, if you will, their understanding of who we are ultimately as followers of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. So rid yourselves of all wickedness, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, desire the unadulterated spiritual milk so that you may grow by it in your salvation, since you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to Him, a living stone rejected by men, but chosen and valuable to God. You yourselves, as living stones, are being built into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Look, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and valuable cornerstone, and the one who believes in Him will never be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for uh, the unbelieving the stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that trips them up. But, in verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the One who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Beloved, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Again, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we come to You pleading with You to speak to us both through the text and through believers who have gone before us, those men and women who have faithfully carried the torch of the gospel forward. We ask that you would quicken our minds and our hearts to an understanding that we might ultimately flesh out our faith in a living and vibrant form that the name of Christ might be exalted and you, our great Father in heaven, might be lifted up. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, again, this morning, uh, I spent some time specifically talking about the doctrine of justification, Luther's understanding of how it is that one comes to a right understanding of their relationship with God and a right standing before God. And that was a revolutionary shift and change for the course of church history. It shapes even the way in which you and I understand what the gospel is, and the way in which we present the gospel to our co-workers and our neighbors and so on. But it wasn't just justification that the reformers changed. Ultimately, there were several other ideas that Martin Luther here really sets forth for us, several ideas that reshape the landscape of the world in which you and I live. Specifically, uh, Luther began to embrace things like the vernacular. That is just simply uh, a a historical way of saying one's common or native tongue, one's heart language. He also uh, reshaped our understanding of authority, the way in which we understand what it is that we found our doctrine and our church practices on, ultimately looking to the text of Scripture to be that guiding force, that guiding directive in our lives. And also, as we'll talk about tonight, his recasting of this idea of priesthood, specifically from this 1 Peter chapter 2 text, would reshape the landscape of the way in which the church ultimately gathered, how it saw its mission, and so on. 
And perhaps just as important, as those ideas, yes, reshape the way in which we flesh out our faith today, more importantly, one of the things that I really want to speak to you about tonight is the crucial responsibility that falls to you and falls to me because of these changes. I mean, I hope that tonight one of the things that you'll begin to see is that the changes that took place because of the Protestant Reformation, yes, they have left a long shadow. They've cast a long shadow on history shaping the way in which you and I worship and even flesh out our faith. But with that comes some massive and monumental responsibilities. And so one of the things that we'll do tonight is think about what these responsibilities are. And as we think about what has changed and what our tradition now holds for us, we also, more importantly again, want to think about the important role that each one of us plays to the success of our local churches. Our role in God's mission, ultimately, here on earth. So let's begin. Well, again, the years of the indulgence controversies go being back to 1517, which sort of set the date for the anniversary. Uh, They were tumultuous. Just think about this in terms of a big storm on the landscape of Western Europe. All of the changes that were to come in and this this new envisioning of the church through this idea of justification by grace through faith alone, it was to have significant changes on the faith as to what would be later termed Protestantism. And as Luther's personal war with Rome, you could say, as that spun forward and continued, a recognition of not only what was wrong with the late medieval Roman Catholic Church, but what the correctives were ultimately going to be. Now, I use the word late medieval Roman Catholic Church for a very specific reason. A, I'm a historian, and so I always am keen to use appropriate language, but also I want you to understand from the outset that the church that Luther dealt with is very, very different than the Roman Catholic Church of today. The church today lives in light of Vatican II that took place in the middle of the 20th century, the church that Luther experienced, the Roman Catholic church that Luther dealt with was very, very different. In fact, the fact that there was a Roman Catholic Reformation is proof positive that there were problems with the church coming out of the medieval period. The question ultimately was, what was wrong? And the answer to that question would shape and direct the correctives moving forward, depending upon who one talked to. Now, understanding where the correctives came from for Martin Luther actually began somewhat rather inauspiciously in 1519. In 1519, uh, Luther conducted a debate very famously in the city of Leipzig. This is the same city where J.S. Bach is buried. The city just to the south of Wittenberg, about 100 miles, and here Luther went and took part in a debate in 1519 with a very famous Roman Catholic apologist. And in the throes of the discussion about papal indulgences and all of the things that Luther was setting forth, he and this man, Johann Eck, engaged in a discourse and a discussion about the church. Now, of most important to this debate here, you can see this sort of set up as two different sides. Luther there on the right, Eck on the left. The most important thing about this debate is the fact that Luther actually lost the debate. The Catholic apologist Johann Eck was a skilled debater, and he did something that was extraordinarily clever. He got Luther in the midst of this debate to align himself with a man by the name of Jan Hus. Now, if you've never heard of Jan Hus, he was a bohemian, a man from what is now modern-day the modern-day Czech Republic. You can go to Prague, for instance, and see statues and things that commemorate the life of this pre-reformer. And an interesting note here is that when Luther was challenged in terms of Hus's teachings, he agreed that Hus had actually gotten it right a hundred years earlier. What Hus had said is there were problems in the church itself regarding authority. That previous popes had actually stated 
differing things and differing ideas as a part of what was to become known as church traditions. Now, why is all of this important? Well, it is important because for Luther, his aligning himself with Hus was a damning alliance. Because Jan Hus, a hundred years earlier, in 1415, had been condemned as a heretic by the Roman Catholic Church and burned at the stake. And yet here is Luther saying, yes, Hus was right. And so what inevitably happens through this very famous Leipzig debate is this. Luther realizes that these papal indulgences, the selling of God's grace through these pieces of paper, they are but a symptom of a much deeper, more systemic problem. What is that problem? Well, the greater issue rested in the fact that the papacy had relied for much of its doctrine and its church practice upon a secondary source of authority outside of the Bible. Yes, the church believed in the text, but they also believed in a secondary source of authority called church tradition. Church tradition would be things like ecumenical church councils, Roman Catholic canon law, even papal decrees. This is true even today. When the Pope speaks ex cathedra or from the seat of Peter, it's as if it were as binding as if Paul had written it in the New Testament or Peter. And according to Luther, this is precisely why the Bible was so very important because the history of the church had had numerous popes setting forth doctrine and practice for the church only to have those ideas rolled back up or differing ideas that contradicted previous rulings and decrees from those popes. In other words, conflicting decrees had proven this very point that you and I know so very well. Humans can and humans do err. That's exactly why when we come to understand what we are to believe doctrinally and what we are to do in in places like this as we practice in our churches, it must be based exclusively upon the Bible. And so what Luther came to affirm very famously there is this idea of sola scriptura, or from the Latin meaning, scripture alone. Now, one of the interesting things, and hear me, hear me carefully here, one of the things that Luther did not do was throw out the idea of tradition altogether. Somewhat of a misnomer about sola scriptura. We think, well, Luther wants to uh, affirm the Bible's authority and so take church history and sort of throw it out, throw church tradition out. Listen, let me say, that's not what Luther meant, nor what it is he did. I'm a church historian. Thankfully, so I'd be out of a job if Sola Scriptura was understood in that context. What then is Sola Scriptura? What it typically says is this. Whatever whatever we come up with in terms of our doctrine and our practice for the church, yes, we take into account what the men and women from our perspective from 2,000 years have said over the ages, but those must always be run through the filter, the, the grid of Scripture. In other words, the Scriptures are the final normative authority when it comes to establishing doctrine and church practice. Still, though, before the Bible was to have any substantive impact in the lives of the people, access to the Bible was going to be absolutely critical. This is where Luther's work, both to break down the very famous divide that existed between the clergy and the laity, as well as his translation of the Bible into German, and what would come to be known as his doctrine of the priesthood of all believers, would set Europe ablaze with Reformation fervor and excitement. But of course, again... Those changes and those advancements, they leave us, you and me, with a huge and massive responsibility that each one of us must maintain. Well, let's think for just a minute about this divide that had existed between the clergy and the laity. The world that Luther was born into in the 15th century was a world that 
created a sharp demarcation, a divide that existed between the clergy and the laity. The priests and the peasants. The pope and the emperor. And these two disparate worlds, these two distinct classes of people, is what divided society into two different spheres. This was the tradition that was bequeathed to the reformers. Now, who were the clergy? Well, the clergy were those men who had been empowered with both the authority and the mandate to exclusively oversee matters of religion and theology. The laity, on the other hand, they included everyone from the emperor all the way down to the lowliest of peasants. And they toiled, if you will, in the less important temporal state. The laity's place in society and culture, much like their work, it was important. But think about this. What was it that the priests were doing? Well, they were serving as mediators of the divine, serving as the stand between between humanity and God. And so as early as 1518, in fact, Martin Luther began to chip away at this idea that there are these two different classes of people. How did he do that? Well, in 1518, he took the 95 theses that had started the entire controversy And he wrote an explanation of the 95 Theses in German. Now, why on earth would that be such a subversive thing to do? Well, the reason why this is so critical to our understanding of the divide between the clergy and laity is this. Latin was the language of the church. It was the language of the liturgy. It was the language of theology. It was even the language of the scriptures the Vulgate. And so Luther, when he pens this new work, this explanation in German, what he did was he chose to speak to his people in their language and on their own terms. He spoke to them in a bold and in a powerful way. His ideas resonated with the concerns of an increasingly dis satisfied people. Or think of it like this. The Roman church, with their use of Latin, were just simply speaking to the external forms of religion because most people didn't understand Latin. But Luther spoke in German, so he was speaking directly to the hearts and the minds of the people. They could understand what he was saying, and they too shared many of these same concerns. And so Luther began to preach in German. He began to write in German. But more important than that, he spent the time putting forth a labor of love to take the text of Scripture and to translate it into the German language. In 1521, hiding in anonymity here in this castle, in the central part of Germany, he was living underneath the imperial ban. He had, he had been excommunicated by the church. He had stood before the emperor, unwilling to recant his positions, and now he was a man on the run. And so he was hidden here in anonymity in the deep heart of the German forest. Never one to let time spill by idly, Luther began to put pen to paper and to translate the New Testament. He he would spend 11 months, uh, 11 a week, 11 months rather. He would spend almost a year in German in Germany at the Wartburg Castle. But listen, he spent 11 weeks translating the New Testament into German. Think about how much time that would take, word for word, working off of the original Greek text to give God's people God's word. Luther refused any money for the work. He did not receive an honorarium. He didn't even receive a free copy that he was promised. But why? Why would he do this? Why would he put the Bible into the barbaric German language of all things? 
Well, here's why. Expressing his desire for his fellow Germans to have access to the Bible, Luther said this, so that we might seize and taste the clear, pure Word of God itself and hold to it. For there alone God dwells in Zion. Do me a favor. If you have a copy of God's Word, hold it up. I trust that none of those are in Latin. You know, our problem today is not necessarily access to the Bible. Our problem is typically just time and intentionality. We have what we need, as Peter would say, for life and godliness. God has spoken to us divinely through this text of Scripture. And now in our country, here in America, it's not about access that's the problem. It's about setting aside the time and finding the intentionality to hear God's Word. And in many places around the globe, they don't have that luxury. Many people would clamor to have the Word of God in a language in which they could understand. This is one of the great gifts of Martin Luther. Now, there were a number of important consequences to Luther's embrace of the vernacular. His translation of the Bible into German, but of biggest consequence, and the thing that I want to really spend a little bit of time with you here tonight thinking through, is his recasting of the idea of priesthood and the way in which the laity were granted a participatory role in the church's life. Now, from the outset, Luther made clear that he believed this idea of the clergy being over here and the laity being divided and separating, that this was unfounded according to Scripture. In fact, in 1520, in his To the Christian Nobility of the German Nation, Luther said this, There is no true basic difference between laymen and priests, princes and bishops, between religious and secular. Listen, this myth exists even now today. As we believe in many of our churches and many of our congregations that there is a divide between the sacred and the secular. We think about this in a number of different areas. Most importantly for many of us in our work. But Luther, recognizing from 1 Peter chapter 2 the important place of all of God's people as a people who are priests. Turn with me, if you would, to Revelation.